want to say shalom and welcome to everyone uh, to this special Talking Memory commemoration event, remembering Elie Wiesel, the man and his writings. My name is Medin Shahar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and educator. I want to welcome our global audience from all over the world, as you can see in the chat box, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums, institutions and centers, academics from universities, historians, and our many friends who attend our Talking Memory series. A special welcome as always to the survivors and their families that are with us today. We wanna thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. And today's program is in partnership with our friends at Classrooms Without Borders and the Rabin Chair Forum at the George Washington University. And as we gather to remember and pay tribute to Elie Wiesel, Nobel Prize, a Peace Prize laureate, author, scholar, human rights activist, and Holocaust survivor who passed away five years ago on July 2nd, 2016. There was a national gathering against anti-Semitism, no fear, a rally in solidarity with the Jewish people at the National Mall in Washington, DC. Organized by Elie Wiesel's son, Elisha, and sponsored by organizations such as the American Jewish Council, the Anti-Defamation League, the Alliance for Israel, and the Jewish Federations of America. We at the Ghetto Fighters House want to say that we stand with you, Alicia, from across the ocean and the sea, and support you in carrying on your father's mission. And now, I would like to introduce Egal Cohen, CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, to give the opening remarks. Egal. Thank you. Shalom. It is an honor to mark the fifth anniversary of Eli Wiesel's passing. With the Ghetto Fighters House Talking Memory Program, along with the hundreds of participants in our audience from all over the world. I think that our international meetings reflect the connections that Ellie valued and the places where he lived and worked. Ellie, a prominent, a prominent Holocaust witness, author, Nobel Prize laureate, and inspirational figure has left us his most important moral will and testament. Ellie's moral voice showed how the past can be seen as a lesson for building a better future to see the warning signs we face every day as a society that strives for life. In one of Wiesel well-known articles, he wrote, because I remember, I despair. Because I remember, I have the duty to reject despair. I draw from this statement much strength to reject despair and to have faith. I would like to thank our partners, pa partners for today's special commemoration program, the Rabin Chair Forum at the George Washington University and Classes Without Borders. I would also like to thank the participants, our speakers, Professor Yoel Rappel, and Dr. Moshe Schneer, as well as Professor Walter Reich, Professor Karen Schaun, and Marisa Fox. I also want to thank Dr. Tamir Hod and Medin Shachar for organizing the event and the international audience that has joined us today, wishing us all engaging and moving events. Thank you, Igal. Uh, Dr. Walter Reich, the director of the Rabin Chair Forum at George Washington University, which is one of our partners for this webinar, is the Isaac Rabin Memorial Professor of International Affairs, Ethics, and Human Behavior, and Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the George Washington University. He is also a former director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and a lecturer in psychiatry at Yale University. He treasures his friendship with and memories of Elie Wiesel. And I now would like to invite Dr. Uh, Professor Reich to say a few words about his connection to Elie Wiesel. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Ika. Um, it's an honor to say a few words at this fifth yard site of Elie Wiesel's death and commemoration of some of his accomplishments, especially the literary ones, but also others. He was especially proud of what he wrote. I think there was 57 books. Uh, and it's right that our speakers in this webinar will focus at least in part 
on his immense literary output and legacy. We all know of what is surely his greatest achievement. He gave a voice to the six million dead of the Shoah, of the Holocaust. The men, women, and a million and a half children who were murdered simply because they were Jews. Through his eloquence in so many languages, especially because of his eloquence in English, though it wasn't his native, native tongue, he made the world remember. It was an art, he was an artist of language and of truth. He told the world what the dead Jews weren't able to utter and what most of the Jews who survived, the minority of the Jews who had lived in Europe were unable to put into the words uh, that others, including the Jews who weren't there, could understand. His audience was the world and his words were so powerful and so piercing that world leaders couldn't ignore him. He spoke of the universal implications of the Holocaust, he always stressed that the Holocaust itself wasn't what most would like to believe. He stressed that it was defined at its core, not by man's inhumanity to man, but rather by man's inhumanity to choose. It was an inhumanity that the world had to remember and from which the world had to learn regarding the breathtaking capacity of human beings to dehumanize groups of fellow human beings. He often told me that I, as a psychiatrist, could understand that better than he could, not true. He was an incomparably wise human being as a chronicler of and devoted witness to the Holocaust. He could understand that far better than almost anyone could. Eli understood that the Shoah, the Holocaust was a spasm and the long history of anti-Semitic violence against Jews in the world. To be sure, it was the worst such spasm, swallowing in its implacable maw, six million Jews. But it wasn't the first such spasm. It was the latest in a very long history of such spasms. And he devoted his life to reminding the world that while the Holocaust was over, the anti-Semitism that underlay it wasn't over and could rise again. That's why it's right that even as we hold this international event in Eloisel's memory, a rally is taking place, as was mentioned here uh, in Washington, here in the States, supported by many Jewish organizations protesting the alarming rise in recent years and especially months of global anti-Semitism that has taken the form not only of Frank anti-Semitism, but also anti-Semitism expressed in the language of, uh, the language of anti-Zionism, a sentiment that seeks to attack and even erase the Jewish state, the Jewish homeland, that had it existed as a state during the rise of Nazi Germany, might have saved the six million. Had he still been alive, Eli surely would have been the main speaker at this rally, as a testament to his legacy, I think it's, it's right that his son Elisha is that speaker. Just a brief word about my own memories of Elie Wiesel. Our friendship and our comradeship were forged during the time I was the director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. That they were forged at that time was no accident. Our views about the Holocaust about all genocides, about human rights, about human behavior, and about the necessity for Israel's survival as the Jewish homeland were, I believe, as identical as could be the views of two human beings. Moreover, the backgrounds of our families were similar. He was a Hasidic, his, his, his background was a Hasidic family uh, in Romania. Mine was a Hasidic family in Poland. We knew the same Jewish history, traditions, and learning, though we knew them immensely better. I was very proud when at his 70th birthday celebration at Boston University, after giving a short speech of gratitude to the celebrants, he sang the Vishnitzer Nikum, a song with a tune that 
was used by his Hasidic group using the words of Psalm 44 that he had learned as a child. The words were, Sabe Yeshua Yaakov. Um, that's the fifth verse of Psalm 44. Uh, and for a long time, I'm not going to try, I'm not gonna, going to embarrass myself by trying to sing it. For a long time after that birthday celebration, I couldn't get the tune out of that nikun that is sang out of my head. But we sang the same tune when it came to the importance of the persistence and the purity and historicity of Holocaust memory. When the US Holocaust Memorial Museum was threatened by the effort by the federal government in the United States to hijack the museum and the museum dead that it represented as a political tool for its own diplomatic purposes, I took an immediate and perilous stance against that effort after all, the federal government owned the Holocaust Museum, and to my everlasting gratitude, Elie Wiesel stood firmly at my side. One more word. Uh, Elie Wiesel survived and could speak for the dead. But think of all those European Jews who did not survive and whose voices and creativity were so ferociously and viciously killed. Still, they were just frozen and, and ended. How many others with different names but equal gifts could have ennobled the world in science and the arts had they not been so horribly and cruelly silenced? We'll never know. But it surely would have been many. Uh, so I remember Ellie with not only admiration, but also gratitude and love. He deserves the admiration, gratitude and love of all Jews and indeed all human beings. Zecher Tzadik Dubracha, may the memory of the righteous be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for contributing your uh, insights and your uh, really deep in connection to Wiesel. Obama, who once visited a Nazi concentration camp with Nobel Peace Prize laureate and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel, says Wiesel told him memory has become a sacred duty of all people of goodwill. The president says upholding that duty became the purpose of Wiesel's life. He died yesterday at his home here in New York City. Wiesel was 87 years old. Wiesel accompanied President Obama and German Chancellor Angela Merkel on a 2009 visit to Buchenwald. That was the second concentration camp where the teenage Wiesel was held during World War II. It's also where the Nazis killed his father. Thank you, Mr. President, for allowing me to come back to my father's grave. Before Buchenwald, the Nazis rounded up his whole family, along with 15,000 Jews from their hometown in Romania, and sent them to Auschwitz. His mother and younger sister died there. Wiesel documented the genocide in his first-person account, Night, and dozens of other books. He embodied the call to never forget those who died in the Holocaust. His 1986 Nobel Peace Prize citation described his message as one of peace, atonement, and human dignity. We must speak. We must take sides, for neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. He was instrumental in creating the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And Wiesel often spoke out against violence and oppression, calling for intervention to stop ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and the Darfur region of Sudan. Do not wait for Sudan's invitation or consent. His widow, Marion, said today her husband waged countless battles for innocent victims, regardless of ethnicity or creed. And yet, what do we do with our gathering, our words, our books, our education? We are trying to educate not only our own children, we are trying to educate the children of the world. And we are telling the world that it is possible for man to fall into inhumanity, to fall when God's image is lost to him. In those dark times, under subhuman conditions, the Jew retained his Jewishness and thus retained his humanity. 
This is the Jewish example to the world. All this we learn from Lohame HaGetaot. Go inside, my friends, and look at the pictures. Do not rush through the halls. Linger, look and close your eyes. Stand in front of the children and the fighters and close your eyes. Look with your inner eye. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that today, July 11th, is the anniversary of Tzivi Lubenkin's passing. She was a founder of the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, Antik Tsukuman's wife. She was also one of the underground fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And I also want to thank you, Marisa, for reading an excerpt from Elie Wiesel's speech at the World Gathering of Holocaust Survivors at the Ghetto Fighters House in 19. 19- 81. Uh, Marissa Fox is an award-winning journalist. We were so honored to have you here to do the reading. Uh, she wrote a thought-provoking article in honor of Elie Wiesel upon his death, and I will post that uh, a link to that uh, article in Haaretz in a few minutes. Uh, she is also the daughter of a survivor. She has been working on her debut documentary film, My Underground Mother. We will put a link to the film's website in the chat box as well. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Yoel Rappel, and also thank him for setting in motion today's event. Uh, Professor Rappel served as Senior Research Fellow at the Elie Wiesel Center and founded and directed the Elie Wiesel Archive from 2009 until 2015 in Boston University. His specializations are in Jewish history and rabbinic literature. He grew up in Israel where he lived most of his life and where he also worked for 40 years as a journalist and senior program editor at the Israel Broadcasting Authority, Israel's main radio channel being credited with over 7,000 radio programs. Before coming to Boston University, he also taught at Bet Bel College here in Israel, the Al Shalom Institute for Israel Studies and served as content manager at the Center for Jewish Identity at Bar Ilan University. Professor Rappel has published 34 books, which have in total been translated into eight languages, and edited more than 80, most of them academic, as well as numerous articles, primarily in the fields of Israel history and the history of the Jewish prayer book, Sidu. His main focus is the connection between Jewish history and the evolution of the Jewish prayer book. Professor Ropel is the editor of the Hebrew editions of Professor Elie Wiesel's books, and today will be sharing with us stories about his friendship with Elie Wiesel that spanned over three decades. Professor Rappel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. The introduction is uh, so beautiful. <laughs> it's very difficult for me to convince you that I'm right well to, to get such a word. <clears throat> I, to speak about Elie Wiesel, I must say that it's, uh, it's really very difficult for me. It's difficult for me because uh, I knew him and even I know him uh, so good and we spent so many hours together and uh, someday somebody making calculation, he said, you spoke, you met Elie Wiesel for more than a thousand hours. So after a thousand hours uh, speaking with Elie Wiesel, uh, you know something about him mm-hmm. and uh, it's make something. And uh, even now, uh, you know, I, I used to spend uh, eight years with Elie Wiesel in the United States. Uh, because first I used to work at the university, at the Elie Wiesel Center for Judaic Studies. <clears throat> and then I took over the archives uh, for more than six years. And the archives, uh, I'm not sure that somebody knows what, how big is the archives, but, but only at the University at the Boston University, we have had more than a million documents on Elie Wiesel um, papers, like a, a collection. So um, to, to speak about him, it's uh, it's really f- difficult for me. I will try to say something about the differences between my uh, ideas about Ellie uh, before we became to work together and after that, because I knew Elif first on 1966, not personally, but uh, when I read uh, Night, when it was published in Hebrew, 
96, uh, 65, um, I decided that one day I must meet Eli Wiesel. I read night twice in one Shabbat. Even I'm going to the synagogue, but I spent the whole Shabbat with Eli Wiesel. And it was very clear for me that one day I must meet him. And uh, I knew the name because he was an Israeli journalist for many years. And uh, then uh, I met him personally first time. I, I will not tell you the whole story behind it, but the first meeting was on November 83, 1983. When I knocked the door on his apartment, he opened the door and somebody left. The other guy was Primo Levi. And uh, on, the, on the same day, I met two, Primo Levi and Eli Wiesel. And uh, I entered to his apartment and we sat together uh, for an hour and a half or something. And he decided that we will come, we will meet again tomorrow. And from 83, uh, we used to speak at least, even I was at the, in the United States as a shaliach, uh, we used to speak uh, every week, at least once a week we spoke together. And after I returned to Israel, we continue our connection. And we met whenever he came to Israel and whenever uh, I came to New York, uh, we met very often. And, but this was not, you know, it's uh, somebody that you know, and it's good for you and maybe somebody, it's maybe it's uh, good for him too. It was interesting for him, but we spoke, we spoke, we spoke, we spoke. I was always was uh, very interesting on the Holocaust. Um, so I will jump a few years because it's uh, not important, the whole process, but um, about the 2000, I decided to, become the editor of the Hebrew version, the Hebrew edition of Eli Wiesel books. And till uh, today, we published 15 books, which include about 20 books of Eli Wiesel, because somebody will combine uh, books together. And uh, it's, it's a quiet number of uh, books of Eli Wiesel. Uh, I don't think that somebody else except Eli Wiesel has such a number of books in Hebrew somebody who is not a Hebrew writer. And uh, then uh, one, one, uh, on one of his uh, visits in Israel, he said that uh, he can, uh, he, he would like to invite me to, my, to make a research at uh, Boston University. And uh, I came a couple months after that. And we spent a year and a half together. And I did the research, but during this time, we started to spoke about the, uh, the archives. Uh, Eli Wiesel that I knew from this moment was absolutely different from the, the guy, from the guys that I knew for already more than 20 years. And uh, we became closer and closer. And uh, on uh, 2008, he said that uh, you started to take over my uh, archives. Oh. And he said, uh, please uh, come to the States and uh, please come join me and take over the, the archive at the uh, library of uh, Boston University. As, as I said already, the, the archive is unbelievable. And uh, you can compare that the, uh, the first uh, most important, even, or maybe the second uh, most important, Eli Wiesel is a million documents. And Martin Luther King, at Boston University is only 60,000. So you can imagine what size the, the, the archive, million documents. It's more than 350 boxes. In, sometimes this number of boxes is a total number of uh, archives in one university. So it was only a Wiesel archive. And um, we have decided that we must organize it. So during this uh, six and a half years, I knew a, a new Eli Wiesel. It was a new Eli Wiesel for me. Absolutely a new one. And um, 
we became a closer and closer. I'm not speaking about only about uh, he, he, about you know his personality. I'm, I'm speaking about his thoughts, his writing, his um, ideas. Um, you can imagine that every week when he used to teach at the university, we met three times. He used to come on Monday and left on Tuesday afternoon. And during this time, we met at least three times for about an hour and a half to two hours. So every week. And once a month, I, I traveled to New York and we sat together for seven hours. And we sat together because, and this was, this was the, the real meetings. Because in New York, on his office, it was unbelievable meetings. I came with the questions from the archive. And you can imagine that it was the first time they had to, to give a report about the document or different documents in his archives. It's unusual that you can ask the guy who is the owner of the archives, that you can ask him questions and to clarify pictures and to ask him, please explain to me exactly what's happened. For example, we spoke a couple of times about exactly what's happened uh, on the White House, on the Bitbook uh, event, and on the, some other meetings that he had first. What was, uh, why he met the first time with uh, Jim, uh, Jimmy Carter. Do you know the story about Jimmy Carter and Elie Wiesel? It's unbelievable because it's very important because when he told me the story, I had to look over in different archives to, to find out the materials. He told me that uh, on 77, uh, Begin became the Prime Minister of Israel. And he traveled, he became a prime minister on May 77, 1977. And two months later, he traveled, he was invited by Carter to meet him at the White House. And um, Carter asked his advisors uh, how he can prepare himself for the meetings with, with um, Begin. And uh, Arthur Goldberg asked him, please, read one or two books of Elie Wiesel. So Arthur Goldberg gave him Night and the, um, the Gate of the City. And uh, Carter met Begin, they had a very good uh, conversation. You know, the, the outcome of the whole meetings are, is the peace treaty with, with Egypt. But what happened to Elie Wiesel? <laughs> The outcome of this meeting was that he became the chairman of the president committee for the memorial of the Holocaust in the United States, which is today the Museum of the Holocaust in Washington. So everything started when Eri Wiesel and when Carter read the book at uh, night. So I spoke with Eri about it. And then I went to begging papers to check what he said about these meetings. And they didn't know that Eli was behind it. And it was very interesting. So we became closer and closer because the meetings took us to, you know, to the corners. It's not straight ahead. It, we, we, we ask, I ask, used to ask him questions that he, he didn't accept them. And many times he said, I don't remember exactly, or oh, I can't tell you. And you must know something else that uh, for Eli, I was the first one who read all the materials in Hebrew. During 25 years from 1947 till 1972, most of early writings is in Hebrew, not in English, not in French, not in Yiddish. And he always told me, you are the only one who read it. So when I came with questions, I used to came with questions that first of all, are from the beginning of his career. And he used to say, 
I don't remember exactly what happened. <laughs> so, and then I met for, I, I, I found in the archives, very interesting um, letters. And we spoke, I, sometimes he spoke about certain letters that I found, but one day I found, I start to find um, letters that he exchanged with the editor of uh, Yediot Achronot, the Israeli uh, paper. Nobody knows about it. Believe me, nobody knows about it. But if I will tell you how many letters they exchanged between themselves, you will not believe. It's over 1,200. So it's over 1,200 that Eli Wiesel and Dov Yudkovsky exchanged. And I'm the only one who read all the 1,200s. So sometimes he asked me what I wrote. And I had to please explain to me. I found an information. And why you didn't include it on your books? <laughs> explain to me the whole story behind it. And I must say that he was sometimes he was very embarrassed because he said, I must think, let me think about it for the, our next meeting. And then we became more and more closer. And I will tell you why. On my first day at uh, Eli Wiesel Archives, I came to the university library at uh, Boston University, and somebody told me that downstairs on the lobby, they have a windows, and one window is about Eli Wiesel. It's next to Martin Luther King. And uh, I went down and look over the windows. Believe me, when I look on this window, it changed my life and even any Wiesel life, but nobody knows about it. So I will tell you one story and then you will understand that we became so close to each other. I saw a paper, one paper, like this, you can see half of it, only this, you can see this paper, one paper of this, and I will tell you what it is. I saw a paper in Hebrew manuscript, and under that it was written, the first manuscript of night. And it was in Hebrew, and I said to Eli, what is this? And he said, his answer was unbelievable. He said, try to find it. He didn't say what it is. He said, try to find it on the archives. I looked over on the archives for two and a half years two and a half years. We check paper by paper by paper. Till one day that I found it. And I called Eli and I said, Eli, I found the Hebrew manuscript of night. And he said, his answer was, please, make copy for me, copy for the archives, and one copy, copy it in your, have it in your hands. You must keep it for the future. So, you know, I found manuscript in Hebrew, and the title was the first manuscript of night. Usually people say, Elie Wiesel wrote night on a ship between Marseille and Buenos Aires, 10 years after the liberation of Buchenwald. I will tell you something. 
This manuscript, this is the manuscript, was written not late than 1950. Not late. Wow. Which means that the first one was in Hebrew. Then I started my research about the develop of night. What was the process in writing night? I will let I will not tell you the whole story. It's a very long story because people used to say that this is on the belt of Gishwagen, this is the first one. The Yiddish one, here this, this one, that this is the first edition. Not at all. This is not the first one. Then I tried to find more and more information in order to know what happened tonight. I called it the day behind night. And we always spoke about the day behind night because even Ellie didn't remember the whole documents that he left on the archives. But you must know that each document that I found and it was important for him make us more and more closer because he always used to say, you know all my top secrets. You know you, my biography better than I know. And usually, Ellie used to call me from New York to Boston and to ask me, could you tell me exactly when I was there and when I was there, what I did in this place, when I organized exactly the, the conference in Haifa and when was the conference in Jordan and when, was, when I spent a week in Russia or wherever, because when we organized the archives, we made something which is unusual. We made the calendar of Elie Wiesel from 1947 till the last day that he gave documents to the archives. So you can imagine that if he had asked me Please tell me when I gave speech in St. Louis in 87 and what was the topics. I had to open the file, immediately I told him. So I became the source for him to know exactly what he did during his life. And it was very important for him. We found more and more details that he didn't include on his uh, autobiography. All the rivers run to the sea and the sea is never full. So we became, and so whenever we ca I came to ask him questions, he said, you know, we must clarify the situation. What's happened exactly? So for example, about night, here is a book. Children of Buchenwald. That's all my book today. Children of Buchenwald was written by the director of, this, of the uh, orphan house that Ellie used to stay there from, 56, from 46 to the end of 47, before he moved to Paris and entered to the Sorbonne. So this lady, wrote a book many years at the end of the eight nineties. She wrote a, a book in Hebrew and uh, uh, in French. And she mentioned, she, the lady, she knew Elie Wiesel very well because she asked Elie Wiesel to write an introduction to her. And the introduction to this book was written by Elie Wiesel. And she mentioned twice on her book that Elie Wiesel used to write his memories from the Holocaust during his time in Amblois, which means the, the orphan house in French. 
Then I found something else that I'm not sure that somebody of know, knows about it. I found a chapter which is called, the, the, the title is The Beginning and the End. I'm not sure that somebody knows about it. He published it in one of his book, but it's, it's very difficult to, to find it. But this was the last chapter of night. But this chapter is not included on night. You can't read it. It's only in a special collection of Elie Bizel. If you will look on the, on the book, you will not find it. What happened? Why Ellie took it off from his manuscript? And on this chapter, Ellie mentioned, I started to write my book in Buchenwald. To think about it. He revealed for us that night is not exactly from 54, 55. Knight was start writing, started writing in 45. So it, what was the whole process? Okay, this is a secret that I will publish in the future. But you can understand that each step that I did, we became closer and closer. And early, even it was, you know, sometimes it was difficult for him that I know all the, the information. He did, he joined me for this research, which is a big research. Another story. I'm sure that everybody knows the name Abba Kovne. Abba Kovne was a very famous one, poet, oath writer, a commander of the uh, partisans in Lithuania, and Abba Kovner, uh, it was, you know, something they, they, they had, uh, at the beginning, they were very uh, good friends, and then something happened between them, but something happened on 86. On 86, Elie Wiesel received the Nobel Prize, and Abba Kovner, he was very sick, sent him a letter. And he sent him a letter and he wrote to him, you are the only one who can speak as a Jew all over the world about the Holocaust. You are the only one. Think about the Abba Kovner, the guy who wrote a few books about the Holocaust, he was very famous. He was behind the uh, house of uh, what we call the, uh, the Museum of the um, Diaspora. Abba Kovner said to Eli is there in letter. And Eli didn't find the letter. So when I found the letter, I called him up and I said, Eli, I found Abba Kovner's letter. And he said, please make a copy now and send it to me immediately. So you can see, you can understand. Again, it became more closer because you had a, a new topic to convert, to, to speak about, Abba Kovner and his relation. So this is the process that we became closer and closer because one day I found letters from the Lubavitcher, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and I knew that Eli decided that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he kept the letters on his office in New York. One day I told him, I found eight letters from the Rebbe in the archives. He said, I need it back. Send it back to me immediately. I said, now it's about time for you to tell me exactly what was your relation with the Rebbe. I knew that they are very close. I knew that they met once night, one night for seven hours, from 12 o'clock to seven o'clock in the morning. But I asked him, please tell me the whole story behind 
the the you relation you good relation between uh, you and the Rebbe. So you can understand from my few words that um, our relation uh, became closer and closer during the years. And I remember that one day he had to receive a, a very important prize from uh, Chicago, from the city of Chicago and from the Department of Education, because you, every year he used to come to Chicago to speak uh, before high school students, 70, 17,000 students gathered in the stadium of uh, Chicago and they, they heard the, the small man in the middle speaking about the Holocaust. 17,000, could you imagine the number? And Ellie used to do it every year for many years. So one day, the Chicago Tribune decided to make an interview before he's receiving the prize. And uh, Ellie told them, if you like to know something about me, please call Joe Rappel. And the journalist called me and he said, I'm coming to Boston to meet you and please give me a few hours to speak about Ellie Wiesel. And I said, but you are going to make an interview with Ellie Wiesel. He said, even if we know each other, Ellie said that I will not come to him. He said to the journalist, you will not come to me before you will meet your rappel. So then I felt that we are so close that I can speak on behalf of Ellie, even if I'm not asking him a question. He said, I trust you 100%. And to receive 100% of trusting from Ellie Wiesel, believe me, for this, you have to work very hard because he knows all the words. Everybody in the world, he knows him personally, the most important guys. And to speak with Ellie and to convince him that he can trust you, it was very, very difficult. So our friendship are so close that I will say something at the end. One day, Ellie told me, you know, must many details of, your, of the information about me that you know, my family doesn't know. Keep it in your brain. Don't speak about it. They never see it. They never read it. You are the only one who knows it. And I must tell you that even today, I can speak about Ellie for hours, but I can say a lot of information that nobody else in the world know about Ellie except me. He knew it, I knew it, I know it. And it's very difficult to me because he was like my father and I was like his son. And when he asked me, don't speak about everything that you saw in my papers, I'm still keeping it. Maybe one day, as Max Broad did to Franz Kafka, maybe one day I will speak a little bit more, but there is so much information that nobody knows that you ask me to speak about our relation. If I know so much about Ellie and you knew about it, <laughs> this is a signal for our closer relation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rappel. Uh, really, uh, it's just a... Uh just the beginning <laughs> of trying to understand. And there's so many other stories that I knew that uh, you had to tell and we'll have to save them for another opportunity. And thank you again uh, for that inside keep, information. <laughs> but then keep something yeah. for the future. Of course, absolutely. Um, 
And uh, I just want to say that when Professor Rappel first discussed an online event commemorating Elie Wiesel, I immediately thought of uh, Professor Karen Sean. And I am so happy that she agreed to say a few words in memory of uh, Elie Wiesel. Uh, just a few words about uh, Professor Sean. She is an associate professor of Jewish education at the Azlieli Graduate School of Yeshiva University, founding editor of PRISM, an interdisciplinary journal for Holocaust educators. Highly recommend. Uh, reading, and in September will be the Director of Educational Outreach at YU's New Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Congratulations. She taught Holocaust education in the Yad Vashem Summer Seminars for a decade and served also as educational consultant for the American Friends of the Ghetto Fighters House, where she pioneered the international book sharing project that I was uh, honored to take a part of, to take part in, and the Holocaust Educators Consortium. She has presented at conferences across America, Israel, and Europe, has written over 70 articles and essays on Holocaust education, and has co-edited The Call of Memory, an anthology of Holocaust narratives. And now I would like to introduce her to say a few words. Thank you very much, Medine. It's my honor to be a part of this important gathering and in such distinguished company. The Hebrew calligraphy of a Torah is written in highly prized, expensive black ink. According to Jewish tradition, the white spaces between the black letters are equally important. They're said to be written also, but with white fire and by the hand of Hashem. While the words tell the story of our people, the spaces between the words give us the room to make our own meaning from that story, to read between the words, so to speak, and understand them based on who we are and how we have come to see and know the world. In a similar vein, Elie Wiesel leaves white spaces between the black words of his narratives. His white space is silence. He wrote that because he felt he could never, quote, rehabilitate and transform words perverted by the enemy, hunger, thirst, fear, he trusted the silence that envelops and transcends words. As we read his works then, we construct our own meaning from the silences as well as from the words. We hear the silence of the bystanders, the beneficiaries, the indifferent world that stood by. We hear the silence of the yeshivot, the study halls, the shtetlach, the marketplaces. We hear the silence of the murdered Jewish grandparents, parents, children. We hear our struggling silence when we cannot adequately describe comprehend, explain, or teach about it. We hear in those white spaces, in those silences, the silence of God. This silence, surely also written in white fire, tells us a great deal about the Holocaust and about Wiesel himself. In his writings, silence serves as a language beyond words. In The Tale and Evening Guest, a prophet whom Wiesel believes to be Elijah suddenly uh -huh. The Wiesel's final Seder. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Outside, as the family searches in vain for him, they are met with silence. In night, we read that his final separation from his mother and his sister Tsipora was silent. In the watch, he reclaims and then reburies his gold bar mitzvah watch in silence. But as Wiesel explained, silence itself can become a way of communication, and communication became his life's work. He was not silent. He would not be silenced. Even today, on his fifth yard site, we hear him perfectly clearly. He called out to the universe every injustice, every act of oppression, every failure to stand up for right, and in doing so, made the world confront at least some of its crimes. When my graduate students and I discuss how they might teach this subject, they're intrigued by the idea of the silence between Wiesel's words and by silence as an option in the face of such suffering. One wrote, we shouldn't be talking. We should be very still and listen for the faint remaining whispers of the greatest of human tragedies. Others disagreed. They believe that silence is not an option, not in teaching and not in commemorating, because no effective action can be undertaken when one remains silent. In fact, it is the works of Elie Wiesel and the rich genre of Holocaust narrative that serve as an antidote to silence, as the central repository of trauma and memory. 
chronicles, memoirs, diaries, and testimonial literature such as Night offer the power and poignancy of a story of an individual which is central to knowing that person. Learning about as many individuals as possible is crucial to knowing the story of the Holocaust. Reading such literature will bring us as close as we can come to uncovering what survivors, whom the next generation will not know, wanted us to comprehend. The world will be bereft when the eyewitnesses to this grim history are no longer with us. We may, though, take some small comfort in the knowledge that when survivors themselves can no longer speak, their literature and the fiery silences between their words will speak for them. To give voice to the lost ones, to grant us the means to hear and to learn from them, this is a gift that Elie Wiesel has given us. Thank you. I can't hear you, Maiteen. Of course, I muted myself. Sorry, I wanted to say thank you, Professor Sean, for those uh, words. And of course, as you, as always, an educator sharing your experiences in uh, the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I would like to introduce our second and last speaker, uh, Dr. Moshe Schneer, who will be giving a talk on Elie Wiesel's search for meaning in a meaningless post-Auschwitz world. Just a few uh, words about uh, Dr. Schneer. He is a senior lecturer at Oranim College. He got his PhD in Jewish philosophy from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in NY, New York City, where he studied the impact of the Holocaust on Jewish identity. Currently, he is a lecturer of Jewish philosophy and heads the history and philosophy department of Oranim College here in Israel. His academic teaching includes topics in Jewish philosophy, Jewish education, Holocaust education, and the challenge of modern Jewish identity interfaith dialogues and multicultural education in a post-Holocaust world. A special place in his writings and teaching is dedicated to the legacy of the Polish Jewish educators, Janusz Korczak and Itzhak Katzenelsen. Besides Jewish studies, Schneer deals with cross-cultural global education programs. Uh, I believe that the international book sharing project was one of those uh, global educational programs and the challenge of the internet world to traditional teaching learning paradigms. In addition to numerous articles and chapters in academic and popular platforms, Schneer published in the beginning, There Was the Holocaust, A Spiritual Journey into the Abysses of History in 2013, Born Virtual, Free Human Spirit in a Borderless World, 2012, and Korczak and Katzenelsen, Two Educators in the Abysses of History, Tel Aviv, 2011 and 2021. Schneer is a board member of the Ghetto Fighters House Holocaust Museum, and of course, uh, a member of the kibbutz and second generation. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Schneer. Thank you, Madin. Thank you very much. I share the screen and then I will start. I hope it will work. I hope you see what I see. We see what you see. Okay, you see it? Absolutely. Okay, great. So um, thank you very but, much. Before I'm you start, to... you should uh, enlarge it. Full screen. That's better. Okay, now I will start. Okay. Ah, perfect. So I have seven slides and I will follow my presentation with it. First, I want to say that I'm humbled to be here with you and as a master of Wiesel's legacy. I met Wiesel only once and I learned a lot from uh, Joel Rappel. Rabbinic tradition state that the pupil is not allowed to say the writer in front of his teachers. So I hope that it will not be taken against me tonight. Thank you, my friend at the Get the Fighters House for in your invitation to be part of this inspiring program and the lead the limited study of his, of uh, Wiesel's text. I want to start not with Wiesel, but with Samuel Beck's drawing from the Lonka Project exhibition at the Get the Fighters House. 
It is today at the Ghetto Fighter's house, a straightforward paraphrase of Michael, Michelangelo's known drawing from the Sistine Chapel to portray the idea that our world has lost its metaphysical horizons and its moral basis. God is missing, man is standing in riots with weapons and uh, broken walls, etc., etc. So we ask after the Holocaust, was it to be a Jew after a death sentence was set, over, was set over the head of all Jews? What is our understanding of the human being after such an ultimate genocide? What is it to be a Westernized person after an industrial death system was built amid the European civilization? We know a lot about the historical facts, but what is the image of our world today? Wiesel envisioned the collapse of the certainty of our spiritual world. The Holocaust is a spiritual, is a metaphysical void, an absolute absence of meaning, a black hole in human history. Wiesel gives words to our inner unspoken feelings, fears, doubts, and thoughts about the meaning of this post-Auschwitz world. The memory of Auschwitz the, the widespread development of weapons of mass destruction, ongoing genocide in different parts of the world, fanaticism and global terror, human trafficking and the continuing abuse of children's rights, the climate crisis, all draw our future in green colors. Despair in, and nihilism are lurking under the surface of our society. In his prolific writings, teaching, and public addresses, as the oil Ravel just gave us a hint of what is there, we then gave words to this challenge in reality. In Jewish tradition, Sinai is a mythic presentation of the start of a new tradition, something created out of nothing, out of nil. We then well aware of the connotation experiences the Holocaust as a new sign, a, gen a genesis event. It gives birth to a new Jewish identity, which we still have to explore. Tova Vo and creation, chaos, and a, si and a Sinai of darkness. Elie the survivor of the concentration camps and the death march, and one of the most important witnesses for the Jewish people after the Holocaust said, when I was asked what about the meaning of the Holocaust, he said the following, what Auschwitz embodied has none. The, the executioner killed for nothing. The victim died for nothing. God ordered the one to prepare the stake, nor the other to mount it. During the Middle Ages, I have to move, the, the Jews when they chose death, were convinced that by their sacrifice, they were glorifying and, and sacrificing God, God's name. At Auschwitz, the sacrifices were offered without a point, without faith, without divine inspiration. If the suffering of one human being has any meaning, that of six million has none. Numbers have their own importance. They prove, according to Piotr Ravitz, that God has gone mad. And then he wrote, to some of us, the Holocaust seemed like a new Sinai, a Sinai of darkness with concealed, concealed moral teaching we are still trying to reveal. This school of thought, one to which I belong, relates to the Holocaust a metaphysical dimension that is beyond the power of language or imagination. Maybe only silence, as, Car as Karen just said. Wiesel expresses the idea that after the Holocaust, all the structures of the meaning of Western civilization in general, particularly those of the Jewish people, were laid waste. The Holocaust is a metaphysical void, an absolute absence of meaning, a black hole in human history. This Holocaust is an existential and meaningless nothingness, the end of reasonable reality. In the Holocaust, not only did the Jewish universe collapse, but possibly all the cultural structures and, and the morals of Western civilization. All Wiesel's writings are an effort to come to terms with this breakdown 
and to construct a new cosmos. With you, I will uh, scan quickly three stages in Wiesel's metaphysics, which portray this radical play. Before the Holocaust, a naive, ordered world. Before the Holocaust, El Wiesel was a traditional committed Jewish boy, taking his Jewish identity for granted, without any distanced reflective thought reflected on his childhood identity as follows. To him, to young Wiesel, all things seem simple and miraculous, life and death, love and hatred. On the one side, there were the righteous, on the other side, the wicked. The just were always handsome and generous, the miscreants always ugly and cruel. And God in his heaven kept the account in a book only he could consult. In that book, each people had its own page, and the Jewish people had the most beautiful page of all. This other world was the world of the Jewish tradition. And as he said, in this world, the Aitzad world, the non-Jewish world, had limited significance, as he wrote, they, the Gentiles, left me indifferent. In the Talmud, there is an expression of olam baru, a clear and meaningful world. This naive sense of Jewish cosmos, as we Zelex has experienced, was shattered, shattered by history. My late teacher, Professor Rabbi Neil Gilman, entitled his book, Sacred Fragments, what we have are only fragments. It is a broken Jewish world. Now, as you all read night, Wiesel's tri trilogy of night, dawn, and day, which expresses his existential responses, to, a response to the Holocaust, marks the transi transition from a God-infused world to a godless world with no transcendent consolation. As a Jew, he writes, you will sooner or later be confronted with the enigma of God's action in history. Wiesel, the boy who entered the camps, lived with a simple trust in Jewish myth of providence and the promise of divine redemption. Wiesel, the survivor of the camps, was left without any hope of divine salvation. Like the Talmud, Talmudic legend of the four who entered the Pardes, Arbaashi Nichnesula Pardes, a meaningless reality, Wiesel emerged as a different person, like Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva as a spokesperson of a shattered people. The death camp survivor now lives in a world where God's presence is no longer felt, and the individual lives with no transcendental meaning in his life and with no messianic horizons. A post-Holocaust individual has to build his limited redemption. The remaining post Holocaust people of Israel enters into a covenant not with a clear God who is no longer there, but with the memories of God. With them, the prophet of the Jewish world, void, a world of destruction and no consolation. The first night in the camp and the endless night that followed destroyed everything, including his pre war identity. And you all know this text. Never shall I forget that night the first night in the camp, which turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget the st that smoke, never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into a rest of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consumed my face forever, Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence which deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things, even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. Night, page 49. So this classical world, the most horrible words men could utter, confront us with the total destruction the Holocaust left in the souls of its survivors. 
A famous story you all know about the particular event in Auschwitz captures for Wiesel the idea that God himself had become a test camp victim, the hanging of the young people along with two other prisoners. And Wiesel's interpretation of it, God is hanged there, became a classical element in Holocaust theology, quoted in numerous texts. The story represents the entire experience of destruction and horror and death camp for Wiesel, and that for Wiesel destroyed God's presence. As Michael Birenbaum wrote, Wiesel had once been prepared for eternity. His life was shattered by history. The Jewish paradigm of, paradigm of Jewish theodicy and messianic expectation has collapsed. For him, as we find in personal account of many survivors, faith died in the Holocaust, forcing him to seek his own spiritual way in a metaphysical world. Wiesel tell us, tells us about his experience of arriving at Auschwitz. Many Jews around him were saying Kaddish, the prayer of death, for themselves. This ancient prayer praises God, glory, and greatness. It gadalvi kadash mei rabba. And Wiesel could, Wiesel could not bring himself to say the traditional words. He could not praise God in the midst of horrors of the camp. For the first time he wrote, I felt revolt rise up in me. Why should I bless his name? The eternal Lord of the universe, the, all, the all-powerful and terrible was silent. What had I to thank him for? In Auschwitz, when the high holiday days approach, Wiesel tells us in the night that the camp inmates gather to say the New Year Rosh Hashanah prayers. The main idea in the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is God's glory and God's justice. This time, Wiesel experienced a feeling of revolt against him. For the first time in his life, he felt that he could not say the prayer. The, the juxtaposition of the New Year's liturgy, which prayers and praises and justifies God, when seen against the brutal reality of the king, was unacceptable, unacceptable and proved an outrage to Wiesel. Wiesel felt angry with the assembled prisoners for having surrendered to the drama of the New Year's liturgy, for still being troubled by the question of God's justice and providence, as he himself had been before the war. In the rebellion, Wiesel refused to bless God's name or to praise the universe in which there were factories of death and Jewish children are thrown into the flames. The reality of the camp was incompatible with the ordered cosmos that the liturgy was trying to build. He describes an, in an elaborate artistic style the Rosh Hashanah service and his reaction to it. It takes a form of an internal dialogue with God whose guiding presence he can no longer accept. And I choose just a small part of it. This day I had ceased to plead. I was no longer capable of lamentation. On the contrary, I felt very strong. I was the accuser, God the accused. My eyes were, were opened and I was alone, terribly alone in the world without God and without man without love or mercy. I had ceased to be anything but ashes, yet I felt myself to be stronger than the Almighty to whom my life had been tied for so long. I stood amid the praying congregation, observing it like a stranger. So the Jewish cosmos, once a spiritual shelter for the young Wiesel, had been destroyed he came to realize that metaphysically and existentially, he was alone in the world. Wiesel expressed a deep sense of loneliness and estrangement, and at the same time, a sense of new strength. To this feeling of deep alienation from the drama of Jewish faith, Wiesel returned time and again in his writings. A new strength and experience is a feeling of moral and metaphysical independence, like the feeling of a child who has reached maturity and independence for his parents. He must and can manage alone without the guidance of God. Then came, the, after Rosh Hashanah, came the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, and the scene returned again, and he said, there was no longer any reason why I should fast. 
I no longer accepted God's silence. As I swallowed my bowl of soup, I saw in the, in the gesture an act of rebellion and protest against him. Against him. And I nibbled my crust of bread. In the depths of my heart, I felt a great void. This void, a personal painful experience of absence, is the core of his writings and brings him to talk of a post-Holocaust godless universe. But as you all spoke about it, the prophet of the void is also the prophet of renewed Jewish life after the destruction. The existential experience of the total void may be answered only by stubborn affirmation of life, even without clear metaphysical guidance of transcendental meaning. The despair emerging from the Holocaust must be at the source of the Israeli demand for unconditional independence. As Fakena, Emil Fackenheim would say later, the only answer to death is a new life, the response to evil is resistance. In one of his novels, Wiesel put in the mouth of one of his heroes the following words. I am not telling you, I am not telling not to despair of men. I only ask you not to offer this one more victim, faith, one more victory. I am telling you to resist. Stay on the threshold, like myself and like myself, you will avenge Kol village. And Kol village was a small town that its Jewish community was totally murdered. From here, from his refusal to give hope and faith, he takes on his post-Holocaust voyage, which all the speakers before me spoke about, in search of meaning in this world. The Hasidic boy, who knew only his world of faith, becomes a spokesperson of all men's solidarity. Like a biblical prophet, Wiesel speak on behalf of all men's rights. Maybe this is the reason why he chose America over Israel as his home, I don't know. Wiesel, uh, Wiesel earned wide approval in the Jewish world, especially outside Israel. As you know before, Yoel, Yoel wonderful project of republishing Wiesel's work, it was actually difficult to find Wiesel in Hebrew. He became an accepted spokesperson of every human being who suffers persecution and the abuse of his, of his or his rights, the agony of every human being becomes his interest. In his late book, which he signed for me when I met him in New York, he wrote something that gave me in a frustration, confusion, maybe Ellie will help me to, to solve it. He wrote the following. There is a passage in night recounting the hanging of a young Jewish boy, the people, that have given rise to an interpretation bordering on blasphemy. Service of the idea that God is dead have used my words unfairly as justification for the rejection of faith. But if Nietzsche could cry out to the old man in the forest that God is dead, the Jew in me cannot. I have never renounced my faith in God. You remember the text before. I have risen against his justice, protested his silence, and sometimes his absence. But my anger rises up within faith and not outside it. Wiesel became a public leader, a public spokesperson for all humanity. And he maybe could not allow himself to speak the words of despair that he spoke as Joel just taught us already in Buchenwald. So my concluding words will be the follows. Wiesel gives words to our own feelings and search for meaning and justice in a broken world. Our oh, naive world is no more. Auschwitz is present in our world. Is Auschwitz is there. We cannot forget it. God was not there to stop the crematorium. He said that Netzach Israel lo yeshaker, maybe Netzach Israel shiker. We cannot deny this thought. Despair and nihilism is beyond the corner of history. Maybe the violence the aggression that we see in our society is late response to this kind of nihilism. 
with all calls us upon us to continue an absurd struggle for a better world. The agony of any human being is our agony. The Ghetto Fighters House tells the horrors of the final solution, but it also speaks about life before the Holocaust, the struggle for life and the resistance during the dark days. Together with the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, it speaks also about life after the Holocaust and about Wiesel's mission of all men solidarity. Thank you. Tada. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Schneer. Uh, what an uh, incredible uh, discussion. I have to say, I uh, want to ask again if there are any questions uh, in the audience, uh, please use the chat because everybody's on mute. But if there are any questions or comments that someone would like to make, Everyone is saying thank you. So uh, for now, I think that what we, uh, what I will do is, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of our guests and participants today, our speakers, uh, Professor Rafael and Dr. Moshe Schneer, as well as Professor Walter Reich, and Marissa Fox, and Professor Karen Sean for your contribution, and of course to Tamir Hod, Dr. Tamir Hod, in uh, developing the concepts for this special event. We want to uh, end our program today with one last clip. We thought that it would be most appropriate to end with uh, Elie Wiesel's words. So, Eyal. The world did know and remained silent, and that is why I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must speak, we must take sides, for neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. Ah, I'm always muted, absolutely. Uh, I will again want to thank everybody, I want to thank our audience for coming today. There was uh, someone who put, raised their hand. I see Michael Goodman wanted to maybe ask a question. I can try to unmute you for a I don't know if I can do that. I don't think so. Okay, I think I'm unmuted oh, now. You are unmuted, yes. Okay, yeah, I had a question for uh, Walter Reich. Um, he mentioned something about uh, politicization, politicization of the Holocaust Memorial Museum by the federal government. I was wondering if he could go into that in a little more detail, because I'm not familiar with that particular uh, issue. Thank you. Wait, Walter has to unmute. <laughs> You're still muted. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, obviously, um, uh, we don't have the time to uh, go into great detail. Uh, but uh, one of the 
just some very, very brief background. One of the concerns before the Holocaust Museum was created was that it would be um, a creature of the US federal government and therefore not fully independent. And there was always the danger that it could be used in some way and the, mem and the, and the memory of the dead could be used. Not only the, the marble and the granite and the, and, and the building itself and the exhibits, but also the memory of the dead, the people, uh, the victims for whom it was um, uh, a representation. And, um, and it was decided nevertheless to go ahead because the advantages of doing that were greater than the potential theoretical disadvantages. However, there was a test in 1998. Uh, the federal government under President Clinton was trying to create um, the impression that it would be possible to, um, uh, for Israel to make a deal with uh, Yasser Arafat. And some people in the administration, this was not necessarily Clinton, but some people in the State Department um, thought it would be a great idea to invite Arafat during a visit to the Holocaust Museum. This was 1998, as I said, in January. And, um, and allay the fears of American Jews about, Yar about Arafat's intentions. Um, some people thought, well, if he went into the Holocaust Museum, he'd come out saying, and this is exactly what Israel does to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when I was presented with this, um, uh, even though um, the chairman of the Holocaust Museum, the presidentially appointed chairman said, this, was, this would be great. Uh, I said, no, I don't think it would be great. I don't think the Holocaust Museum should be used for, for diplomatic and political purposes and should be a tool and should be hijacked for that purpose. Um, this was a difficult moment for the museum, for me, and for anybody who believed that the Holocaust dead should not be hijacked. Um, and it's with gratitude that I remember that, Hulk, that Elie Wiesel stood by me as I refused to give, give in to this pressure, a pressure uh, to which many American Jews actually did give in. Uh, and um, he supported my decision. And I, it's one of the many, many reasons I'm so grateful to him uh, for uh, having uh, been Elie Wiesel. <laughs> Thank you so much for those words and for elaborating. Let everyone know that in the chat there are a lot of people saying thank you for the uh, different presentations, the different perspectives, and again, I want to say thank you to all our guests today. I think that uh, we got through it through Zoom. I don't know how, but um, I really appreciate. And again, uh, meeting with our partners and with our longtime friends and uh, people who have known Elie Wiesel for a very long time and have written about him and uh, helped us to get a better understanding of who the man was and his legacy. So thank you all. And of course, I want to thank our audience once again for coming on a Sunday morning, afternoon, <laughs> here in Israel evening to uh, take part in the program. So as we say here, shalom and toda. Thank you. <laughs>